Welcome everyone for this week's lecture. It's sort of a, a follow-up from um, a couple of weeks back when Dave had uh, graced us with some very interesting ideas that pertained to a paper that he had written on the issue of transcendence from trans to transcendence. Um, a really, really fruitful conversation flowed out of that. And there were a lot of open questions um, as all, I think, good qualitative ideas should never have just a full closed crystallized answer. There, were, there should always be more questions uh, that are sparked in the mind um, of, of participants than answers, although answers should also be <laughs> uh, acquired as well. But we, uh, we had a lot of open questions. So we're gonna continue the thread of some of these things which have taken a lot of inspiration from, or the, this dialogue and this presentation are gonna take some inspiration from a, a new essay that Dave had written, which we just published on the Canadian Patriot site called Breaking the Binds, Curing Western curing Western schizophrenia. There's obviously a lot of emphasis on our, in our current society around the question of normalcy. You know, a lot of people are just desperate to just return to normal. Oh. There's questions of new normal, right? New normals, different ideas of what those normals are. But the word normal itself is a very deceiving word because what, what happens when your society and what is normal in society is sick as sin and unnatural, very abnormal, right? What happens when sickness becomes normal? Do you calibrate yourself to that? Is that your ideal for what health is to, to become uh, just as sick as everyone else? Or do we have a higher standard? So Dave approached a lot of these questions and I thought a very unique and, and powerful way utilizing the figure of people like Artie Lang, other Tavistockians, Greg Bates and was inferred upon. So we're gonna talk a little bit about that. Uh, Dave, thank you so much for continuing this. And, and for those who don't know, by the way, I put the, uh, the essay in the chat box. So if anybody hasn't read it yet, you can read it after this dialogue is done. If you have read it, I'm sure you'll have a lot of questions. And like usual, put your name in the, in the chat box because this is going to be a more interactive presentation. So I'm going to just call upon people as I see their questions popping up in the chat box. Um, put your name up if you want to ask a question. If you want me to ask the question, write it very concisely. Um, so I can understand exactly what you, you have in mind. Um, so Dave, thank you. I don't know if there's any opening remarks you want to start with. Uh, maybe, um, not, not sure, not, not necessarily. I mean, there's tons of things I could say. Uh, you, you talked about there being, uh, yeah, there's a lot of, I mean, we're all faced with big questions right now. There's all sorts of uh, wild things going on in the world. And even when we get to the truth of things, there's always new questions, bigger questions. Uh, so I, I like the theme, uh, the idea of there are certain mysteries, right? Once we start, or maybe put it this way, we're, the reason we're talking about uh, sickness, right? And there's a lot of study of sickness. Uh, you know, you can be a psychiatrist or therapist and you're always dealing with sick people. And there's these interesting cases where uh, I like this idea that we can only learn so much about health from studying sickness, right? It's easy to get lost in the mechanics of things, studying all the conspiracies and crazy things going on in the world, uh, but forgetting that that ain't it. You know, that's not the real thing. So. You know, we, we, we may descend into the underworld, but it's not, it's the underworld. We can only learn so much about what creating paradise or what paradise looks like from going into the underworld. We can only know so much about health uh, from studying sickness. So I think we always, the key for these kind of articles is always uh, the real thing. You know, how, how to pursue the real thing and seeing the limits of just trying to study the bad can only go so far. And I feel that's where I think we've all, and a lot of people get lost, right? They get so absorbed uh, in the sickness. They're gazing into the abyss. I, I, it's Nietzsche who said this, I think, and the abyss gazes back, right? People become black-pilled. Uh, they become disenchanted, whatever you want to call it. So we want to talk about the sickness, sure, but we should never lose sight that I think the point is to get to the good stuff. We want to get rid of the sickness so that we can get to the good stuff. And there's only so much we can know about what the good stuff is uh, from being stuck in the sickness. Yeah. Well, you, you made the point in the article that uh, people like 
Artie Lang, who's a, a major influential psychiatrist who's had a huge effect upon um, the zeitgeist, I, I suppose you could say, in today's world, um, is somebody who, well, before going into the, his work on the, on the underworld, on, on going into the, the darkness and exploring the human condition from that standpoint, um, through work on schizophrenia in the family unit. Maybe you could say a little bit something about who is Artie Lang? What made you zero in on this figure? Why is he important? And what was he actually doing um, regarding the question of schizophrenia? What impact did that have in terms of right. uh, shaping world systems? Right. I mean, it's definitely, it's a really interesting uh, story, right? Like he's an interesting guy. Some of, the, some of these, uh, you know, he's an interesting Tavistockian. He's not a two-dimensional uh, just weird social engineer. He is, well, he is a weird social engineer, but uh, no, he was obviously, I mean, schizophrenia, right? Like there's, these are, we still only understand so much about this, right? But Lang was also looking at it. The idea was he was looking at the, the characteristics and he talks a lot about existential phenomenology. And uh, so he's a psychiatrist and he's studying the experience of the schizoid experience and how in, in many cases, right, as psychiatrists, you see people are split, right? They're, they're split into different parts. And I mean, we all have this, or we've all experienced this in ourselves and others, where, you know, we have like a work life, we have a this life, we have a that life. Uh, people are always uh, splitting in different ways. And so Lang was looking at that. And of course, this is where you start to flirt with this idea of, well, how sane is our society if people are split in all sorts of different ways? And uh, so, I mean, he was a psychiatrist and he was a resident at Tavistock from 1956 to 1965. So he studied at like the mother of, you know, group dynamics, brainwashing and stuff. And, but he, and he also treated a lot of very sick people and he had a bit of a philosophical mind uh, and he, as we, we mentioned the underworld, right? He talks about Freud. And like, there is this subterranean world of all sorts of different things that uh, people say one thing, or they say they believe one thing, uh, but they feel something very different, or they act very differently than what they think or what they say. And so he talked, he looked at this idea of make-believe, right? That early on, uh, we all learn to, children learn to make believe in different situations. Uh, and we could say some make believe is good, Santa Claus, oh, yeah. Uh, and then some make believe less good. Uh, but I, I like the idea of introducing maybe a distinction that we have stories, we all have a story, we all have a life story, humanity has a story, uh, and there's make believe. And stories uh, contain some deeper truth, right, some moral, some deeper wisdom, something. It's hidden, but it's there. It's to discover. Make-believe is the opposite. It conceals the truth, right? It, it creates a, an illusion, something that uh, hides the truth from us, from ourselves, and from others. And so Lang explore, ex he explored a lot of this, and, you know, as Freud did, and you can naturally get uh, sucked up into that, right? Because if you're in a world of false selves and false worlds and false realities, uh, how do we find the higher ground by which to transcend it? And that was part, that was part of the question he looked at. Uh, and this is where he started to look at madness versus the well-adjusted individual. And so the, you know, the, the, this idea of madness is, you know, kind of, uh, transcendent, he, it was the idea that the the mad people seem to be more in touch with certain things than the well-adjusted people who had just kind of learned to, to, to do the make-believe stuff and to just kind of make it their identity. And so they're the one-dimensional man or whatnot. So we see this, right? There's a lot of existential observations. That's like, yeah, it's kind of true. Um, but yeah, so then how do we really transcend it? And so naturally the madness seemed closer to breaking out of a fixed thing than the well-adjusted individual. So from the standpoint of a Tavistockian 
they're modeling, right? They're very materialism kind of uh, uh, centered. So madness naturally from a modeling standpoint seemed closer to uh, freeing yourself, right? Breaking out of binds. And this, at the same time, they're very binding. <laughs> But that's the paradox that he was looking at. Can you um, say a little bit more? Because it, it is common, it's true, to hear even amongst existential philosophy, we see it in our, our, our cinema as a theme, this tendency to recognize that or to make comp past judgment, and rightfully so in many cases, like you alluded to, that society is robotic, mechanized, soulless, um, so that's, those are not necessarily untruths, but like you said, yeah, the thanks. solution concept to it is more than lacking. Um, in the case of Artie Lang, it was found something, you know, he was looking at it more from the standpoint of cultivating the, the, the thing that society deems mad, you know, that, that, that is not adapting well to the, uh, regimentation. Um, how does this play into his insight or what, what understanding and definition yeah. of schizophrenia did you, do you think that he saw in society as well as in the family unit since he was, he saw the family unit as being a reflection of society. Um, how, how did he see that schizophrenia? What was it? What was it in his mind and how did it, did it get manifested through these double binds through these knots that you've uh, you wrote about in your essay? Cause you, you, you took it apart quite a bit. I thought that was quite right. Should, should I? Um, why don't I just read the the first knot, just in case for anybody who hasn't um, at least seen the essay? Huh? Yeah, just to make it visceral. Just to... yeah. So this is a knot. This is an example of knot. They are playing a game. They are playing at not playing a game. If I show them, I see they are. I shall break the rules, and they will punish me. I must play their game of not seeing, I see their game. Now, when I hear that, I mean, he's modeling dysfunctional families, right? And this is where we get into games and binds where the idea of a bind is you can't win. You know, if, you know, good little boy girl has to tell the truth because perfect good boys and girls always tell the truth, but then you say something to upset uh, mommy or daddy and then you're punished. So finally, you're punished for telling the truth. So, but if you tell the truth and you, you're, you're expressing whatever is going on inside you or what you see, uh, you're punished. And if you don't, you're, you're broken off. You're, you become a divided self. And so people become these divided selves and they model this. You know, it, it, what is most of our propaganda matrix, if not a series of binds, right? Are you left Democrat or are you Republican? Are you alt-right or are you alt-left? Um, you know, are you vaxxed or are you unvaxxed? Uh, communist China versus capitalist West. It, it's, they're all binds, right? And people are so stuck in them, right? That when you, when we, as you do, Matt, when you get into the nuance of a lot of the PSYOP stuff and like, it's actually, it's none of the above. It's much more nuanced. Uh, people they're just stuck, they're trapped. And so there's very little in the psychological warfare stuff that we see today that isn't something you couldn't see modeled in the dysfunctional family, right? So most, you know, politics, R.D. Lang, he wrote books, the politics of the family, the politics of experience, um, all these things, what is a political party, if not a kind of tribe, and what's what's a fam what's a tribe if not an extended family? And so people in their family dynamics are very different than uh, outside their family dynamics or whatnot. But if you extend those, that's what they were looking at. That then you see people start to split off. They have make believe. They have things that they do to to function in the system. And so once you start to model that, this is where you you know what are the binds to keep people in their tribes and sort of you know, they can't win, right, one way or another. Uh, you know, they they, they're they fighting the other tribe, but then, you know, they go to challenge their own tribe and what happens. And so people, there's a bind. And what do they do? They just become these one-dimensional spouting slogans. They can't handle 
something uh, more complex and they probably never learned it uh, at some other point in their life. They, they weren't, you know, humbled with an experience or fortunate enough to counter a guide. You know, Dante had a guide in the underworld. That's the other thing I talk about uh, in the essay. So if you're stuck in these worlds without a guide and enter the make-believe, enter the illusions. I guess that, that sort of is something that's very interesting that you brought up Dante in your essay um, as, a, as a sort of counterpoint, because Dante has also went into the underworld, into, I guess, what you could consider the, the, um, the darkness of the subconscious realm, the forces of things that we often don't realize are bubbling below the surface of our conscious thought. Um, the difference being, and, and Gregory Bateson and many of the Tavistockians did something very similar, but, but Dante had something they didn't have. And right. he was able to take that which he had, which may, maybe would have, <laughs> I mean, you kind of feel a bit bad thinking about R.D. Lang and, and looking at his personal life and how in a, uncapable he was at breaking out of the darkness that he he delved into of the of the subconscious yeah. forces. Could you say a little bit something about about that? Yeah, well, I, I like the idea of the simple truths, right? I think somebody like Lang, uh, like many people, like many of us at different times, uh, you know, we lose sight of the simple truth in sort of trying to model and make sense of all the mechanics of, of, of the daily, uh, of our experience, daily experience, whatever, family experience. Um, you know, there, there are certain things that you can't model. You can't model the soul. You can't model creativity. You can't model the mind. And so we get into trouble if we start to shape our understanding of reality and the reality that we live in based on trying to model based on trying to model reality after our experience forgetting that there are certain things that you can't model and then the question comes well okay so how do you know these things right how do you know these deeper things and so this is where i like the idea of mysteries the actually the simple truth is there are these the certain mysteries. The mind is a mystery. Creativity is a mystery. The mystery of our own souls. How do we explore the mystery of our own souls? No amount of modeling will allow us to do that. And so you see that these experts, they know everything about a problem, right? But when you start talking about a solution, a transcendent approach, a way to transcend all these things, uh, they don't really have anything on it other than, you know, you, you get things like madness seems kind of closer to creativity than well-adjustedness does. So that's a modeling thing, right? Well, it's, we seem to model that the crazy people seem a bit more flexible. Uh, so maybe there's something there because they don't have access to it in themselves. They don't know it as something living in themselves. And so they create these very complex models and things to try and understand reality. And it's same with game theory, right? Same with information theory, trying to model how the mind works. And I was thinking about reflecting on how LaRouche would talk about the discoveries that he made in economics and whatnot. And that really the breakthrough came for him when he realized that there was a lot of fakery with all this modeling, information theory, game theory, and da, 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 in economics as well, because there were certain things that you can't model, like human creativity, like the soul, like where discoveries come from. And this is what actually drives economies. This is what actually drives societies. So what's going to happen to uh, a world if we're confined to only the things that we can model outward without any idea of how to approach the mysteries, which will remain mysteries. And actually that's all we will really know are the mysteries, 
are the, these simple truths. Everything else is detail. The details are infinite. But what we really know are these basic mysteries. And that's what we really want to explore. And I think that's what LaRouche, that's, that was the basis of physical economy, was that there were these, these basic principles, I call them mysteries, uh, that were driving things. And that's what we had to really come to understand if we wanted to really change ourselves or a society, an economy. Question, because, and then we're gonna get ready to open up for, for Q&A with the audience soon. Um, but couldn't you say that what Dante was doing, and maybe you could really just write a little bit of what Dante was doing in the yeah. Comedia was a sort of modeling in a, in a sense of that process of, of, of the cre of creativity in, in as far as how we go through a process um, that leads us into a solution concept to the same problem identified by R.D. Right. Lang. Um, That's so yeah, well, and, and I think you referenced uh, this question of double loops instead of double binds as a healthier way of trying to resolve the question, which Dante was sort of doing without calling it double loops. But I mean, there was, there was um, something different there. So maybe you could recap or go through what Dante was doing. And could you not say that that was a form of healthy modeling in, in a sense? Right. Well, that's why, yeah, I, 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 I got partially sidetracked, but not really. Now everything I'll say now will sort of key off of that. Uh, well, yeah, Dante never lost sight of the simple truth. He had a higher voice, right? There was a higher voice of reason. Uh, there was an inner voice. There were many voices, actually, which is what is interesting if you think about it. When we're talking about creativity or Dante, there was Virgil, that's one voice, classical wisdom, right? Bridge to the classical world. Uh, and then you have this other voice, Beatrice, who is in the higher spheres, always calling him. And so he's not really alone when he's in hell, right? He's got all these things that he's uh, communing with uh, and tapping into. And so, yeah, no, there's you can't model all of that, right? There are certain, there's a deeper voice that was guiding Dante the whole time. And that's what he was really getting acquainted with. And the external modeling of the inferno, all this, all, all, all the sin after sin, madness, scene of madness after uh, scene of madness was really the absence of that, right? And seeing what that looks like. So there was always this higher transcendent, uh, which Lang would also try and get at, but always stuck within this modeling framework where everything kind of falls off once he tries to uh, take that leap. And so Dante takes that leap. And I guess the point is the models, you can't model that leap. He's, you know, when he goes in purgatory, uh, you know, there's the great, he has to go through a wall of fire to, to kind of, to, to finally sort of purge everything. And he's scared, right? He's, it's, I, I believe it's the final one is like the wall for lust and like, it's the last thing to remove. Um, and he's, he's, he's petrified and he can't do it. Uh, and what, but then there's Beatrice's voice and there's, there's a calling. And that's the thing that reminds him. And that's the thing that sort of, and so he jumps through. He takes that leap of faith, knowing there's this higher voice uh, of love, right? It's not, he's not in this dead system that's sort of uh, calling him. What I liked, you, you, you cited, or I'll just take this straight from your, your writing, where you describe how the schizoid personality that Artie Lang was exploring in, I guess this is in his work, The Divided Self, that you had read. Uh, mm. The schizoid personality was either trapped watching their inner world from the outside or watching the outside world from the prison of their inner world. Mm. But in, in a word, you say they were estranged from their own self, exiled from home in their own body. So you had this, whereas what you're describing here with Dante and, and the process with the guide of, of Virgil and then Beatrice, 
is that there was an ability to see that we're both other, like to, to, we have to be able to, when we have a dialogue with ourselves, well, what is it that we're having dialogue with? You know, like this is what Plato was always getting at is teaching people that we have to learn how to have a dialogue with ourselves. but it, who is the other that is having the dialogue with the self? Who are you talking to, right? So we're not simply this one dimensional sort of character. If we're talking to ourself, we're, we're disciplining ourselves. you know, and there's this statement like, you know, if, if you're not master of yourself, um, if, or if you, if you are a master of yourself, if you, if you discipline yourself, then aren't you also slave to yourself, right? So there's always this sense that goes back into ancient history of, of this concept of the, of the being as being something we look down upon, but also that we look out at the objective world from as well, the subjective right. objective. And in, in the Dante case, you were getting at how by the end um, of the, par the, the journey through paradise, after he had, he had prepared his soul and had overcome a lot of the the things that were, were partially inside of him holding him down that he was seeing in, yeah. in, in, in the inferno and in, in purgatory, there was a, a resolution where he, he saw sort of the light, I guess, sort of synonymous with Plato's cave, right? Where the, the true philosopher breaks out of the cave of the shadows and looks upon the light as it is. And he sees something um, which resolves this inner outer dichotomization, this dividedness in, a, in an right. interesting way. Um, could you maybe elaborate on that a little bit or? Yeah, I mean, it's, again, so that's why Lang's interesting, right? Like we, we can really get into this divided self idea. And um, I mean, we talk about breaking off the, the, the quote you read about the, you know, the schizophrenic is like estranged from his own body and, you know, uh, a stranger, uh, you know, in the home of his own body and whatnot. Um, so he's disassociated in a sense. There's also, you could say, uh, healthy forms of disassociation. They're not really disassociation, but if you're a, if you're a conscious human being, you're looking at yourself, right? You're you're you you want to zoom out and be able to to look at yourself and sort of play out where you are, what you're doing, right? Using your imagination. And conducting some thought experiments, ex ex imagining yourself in different situations and play them out. You know, where, where are you going? What are things going to look like uh, in X, Y, Z? Um, so there's all sorts of, there's healthy ways, you could say, technically to uh, investigate oneself and, and split off into different ways. But there's a plan in a sense. You're kind of, you're, you're, you're going somewhere with it. Um, and I think coming back to yeah like how to be whole i guess this is the big question how do we become whole um and it's where transcendence comes in and i think ironically the transcendence is um well we think of transcendence as like escaping right G getting out of something so that's another kind of disassociation and so how do we become whole i.e always be present and i think it comes back to that same inner voice thing that like there, we all have that inner voice. There's that thing, there's that whispering uh, that we can choose to listen to or not. Creativity is there. It's also like a voice. You know, the Greeks had the muses. That's a lot of voices. So it doesn't mean we're schizo, right? If, if we're being creative, there's technically a dialogue among many different voices. Um, and we're present. We are listening to these voices. Um, and then I think of something, here's a fun one, Joan of Arc. God tells her to save the nation of France. You know, what would the typical Sam Harris or, you know, materialist uh, pop guru called whatever you philosopher person. Oh, what is she just some schizo broad who's got like crazy voices talking to her? Well, think about it. Right, if if you see that there is this great um, danger or crisis, and you hear something that's telling you you need to do something, are you not responding to to a deeper voice or a deeper calling of some sort? And maybe the psychoanalyst, the cynical one at least, 
oh, well, it's just for your own like self-interest or whatnot. But what happens when that inner voice isn't necessarily telling you to do something that's in your personal self-interest, but that is necessary and you're listening to that. So, and I think that whole idea of that the wholeness and the real transcendence is when we're literally always listening to that. That's actually, well, I think the catch is that's actually us. Everything else is a bunch of different things. There's automatic systems. We've got all sorts of things, right? Um, maybe you're listening to the voice, the inner voice at the wrong time and the car's coming, you know? So your automatic systems will technically be the thing that gets your brain to, uh, before you can think about it, or if you're driving, right? You'll just swerve. Your brain is the thing that's kind of kicking in there. You, you're doing it without consciously making that decision technically, right? Something's coming in to save you. Um, but yeah, so I think the getting in touch with that deeper, those deeper uh, whisperings, right? I think that's where you, you and this, you, then that's where you get the soul, right? And you're, you're, you're listening to your own soul and um, to push it one extra degree. Uh, there's this fun, uh, one of the saints, you know, Dante, who, who's in paradise. There's a lot of saints in paradise. <laughs> Uh, St. John of the Cross, he has the two nights of the soul. And so he talks about the, the soul in the journey to the summit, uh, you know, uh, the soul being betrothed with, to the divine, where basically the divine will becomes your will. Um, first, there's the purgation of, you know, the body where you're not kind of attached to worldly things as much. And you're, you're just acting. And so they talk about, you know, swear like prayer, meditation, you're working at it, you're, you're sitting still, you're not thinking about anything else. Um, that's the first night of the soul. But then there's the second night of the soul, where it's as if it's described as your soul dies. And it's not, it's not really you anymore, per se. It's the divine itself. And so your soul is moving according to uh, the divine will. You're always yourself. Actually, you're becoming yourself. That's actually what who you are, that image of God uh, in each of us. And so I think we're present the whole time for that, right? The other stuff is when we're not present, I guess is the way we could see. We could see the other stuff is when we're not actually that present, Um and Schiller says the same thing in his poem that I, I translate for the latest uh, issue. He says, make the, make the divine will your will. Make the divine will your own and see how quickly Zeus drops his bolt. Once the divine will becomes your will, there's no more tension. And that's, the tension is the not wanting, you know, is, is, the, is the opposite of when it's not the divine will. And I mean, that's, What's Dante following, right? What's he doing? What's calling him as he's in the underworld or as he's in purgatory? So there's this simple uh, truth or mystery or voice that's always guiding him. And I think if we're listening to that, then yeah, we don't need to really go anywhere. Yeah. Really this, this sense of, of this faith in a goodness and loving a creative force is something definitely devoid in a lot of the the psychiatry, the nihilistic psychiatry movement that really took over the 20th century, where they're really good at looking at the darkness and the hypocrisy behind the surface appearance of things, but they're really bad at seeing a higher, healthier way of being that would be in alignment with a true healthy state. And I think you did a really good job. Um, before we, we move over to um, Messi, who has the first question. Um, actually, you know what? I'm, not, I'm gonna withhold my question because I feel like I've asked too many at, at this point, but I might, I'm gonna throw in a question later on. But Messi, why don't you go ahead and, and, uh, and throw out your thought? Everyone, one by check, the way, check. default on mute. Is uh, my mic working? Yes, it is. Yep. Is it loud? Yes. Yeah. Great, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks to Mr. Gosselin for being here. And of course, thanks to the Rising Tide Foundation for hosting this talk. 
Uh, this was a really interesting topic to me, um, and I can see all kinds of, of connections to um, from psycho psychoanalysis to uh, Schmidt's friend enemy distinction and the families and the tribes and everything to the um to the objectivity of social realities and the model aspect I really love because when I was younger uh, I was really into Gauss and his relationship to math making um, map making and mathematics mm. and model making um, that relationship being the um, the perfect model of reality is reality itself and because in a model in making a model of something you have to sac sacrifice like some act aspect of real life to represent that thing um but let me get to my question because uh i don't want to ramble um you hinted on this a, a little point. yeah yeah <laughs> you you hinted on this a little bit um but many people build entire worldviews on these so-called um double binds and false dichotomies so the resulting fallout in exposing the illusion is usually um rejection or some type of psychosis or inability to cope um and personally i have a few close friends i like to call them uh establishment defenders and they That's fall into funny. this category of people who uh buy into the dichotomies but right. from my conversations i know that they know that the um the game theoretical models and paradigms of that the rand corporation and other social engineers use aren't really capable of reflecting human decision making and values um so from the perspective of someone from this background who wants to um research more and understand more how would you approach this sudden lack of grounding so to say right i mean that's a fun question and i mean i have conversation we all have conversations with uh what, what did you call them Estab establishment defenders <laughs> establishment defenders yeah, yeah that's a funny one um well actually but those are the fun conversations too right like i think i i get a lot out of like that's part of i consider it part of my healthy uh practice is always sort of uh sparring like in a healthy way always playful right because i don't get upset like i'm i'm you know i think like i have the perfect argument this time and i'm gonna get them and then sometimes they throw something and it's like okay that's that's not a bad like i still think i'm right uh, i know they're wrong but like they're saying something uh compelling and it's always the kind of sciency mm -hmm. modeling uh positivism the positivism addled minds right where it's you know what we said at the beginning like there are certain things you can't model. And so the positivism addled mind gets very scared because this opens the world to the, the whole thing to irrationality. Well, if you can't model the thing and we start speculating about things that you can't model, that's dangerous. We're gonna start coming up with like angels on pins and all sorts of things. Uh, so hence the need for modeling, hence they must close themselves off uh, to uh, any, any other uh approach uh be less they run the risk da, da, da. and so i mean i've had many conversations where i always like yeah but don't you agree there's certain things love you can't model love actually i, I was having he was having trouble sleeping uh, this person a lot of i have a lot of anonymous stories so person's having trouble sleeping um and they do everything they do like the micro dosing of the the, the mushrooms and the this right. and the that I'll say, you know, Sam Harris Bible, whatever. Um, meditation. And of course it's still not working out as uh, like, and I said, I had a book, I had a neuroscience book. And so I mentioned something that, you know, pop neuroscientists. And I said, uh, have you tried loving kindness? You know, like, do you give yourself loving kindness? Do you, do you tap in to that deeper, self and just give yourself a bit of loving kindness and then he went he started talking about well like our idea of love is isn't that more like an evolutionary thing and he starts talking about the vikings and like didn't like the kids wasn't love more a survival thing that you would have kids and because that was like your way to whatever defend your army or whatnot and i was like okay but no but like a child knows if they're not getting actual love right like being seen right and loved as their authentic self like the child doesn't need to do anything to be loved it's not something they need to earn and so that was my way to try and get in there uh, to say that there's this thing called love there are these things that you can't model and if people don't have these things or they don't develop these things um they become very sick right mental health is is a is a thing these days 
I mean, it's always been, but um, there was more light shined on it through the descent into all these subterranean worlds and recesses. But then there are, there's these things that we can't model. So how do we tap that? I think we have to have fun and, and you know, ironies. Like what, what would, right. I think I asked him like, what would you tell your baby? You know, like, do you love your baby or are you telling your, you know, like, what is your relationship to that? And he couldn't think of it other than some like, must be wired to some like, I'm wired to evolutionary love my kid uh, and not eat it uh, because I need to like reproduce and or, or something like, that's a bit, that's, that ain't the real thing, right? There's the modeling. It's like, well, it must be because of this. And there are these, the mysteries, science needs mysteries, right? What we think of as facts are the details, I'd say. But the, the mysteries aren't going away. It's actually in taking away the mysteries out of science that all of a sudden nothing makes sense anymore. You know, black holes and big bangs and like the universe is just a dead machine. Uh, we're all just lost in this loveless machine uh, that's just winding down. And uh, that's so-called science today, right? Looking for dark matter and all sorts of things because uh, it's all purposeless. And they're not able to, I think, humble themselves, right? To have the humility because they're, they're very conditioned a certain way that there are certain things that we can't model and they're kind of driving everything. They're driving you, they're driving me, they drive creativity, right? They drive insight. And if we sacrifice that, you know, bye-bye art, bye-bye beauty, bye-bye love, bye-bye truth, uh, we just have cold hard facts and then you know or then eugenics and everybody's here for the party you know because why not why not have a very efficient society i went on a rant there but i like the idea of playing around i work these you know we work these things out and then when we have a conversation with somebody we just try one play it out get them to play it out what would you do in this situation how would you talk to your baby mm -hmm. whatever it is See if they open up. It, it removes it from the, the abstract logical domain and makes it much more real because it's like, okay, you have to apply your thoughts to reality and see how they play out. But that requires a bit of imagination. So when you come up with a, a playful scenario, and you, get, you, you make it less about this objective thing you're talking about and it becomes, well, no, you're part of that objective thing. You, you're, you can't disassociate Correct. yourself from it. And then, then you know, you get a more honest conversation at least. So yeah, I see how you're play out the darker scenarios, right? Like using the, their logic. I mean, mm -hmm. I was just asking them about like the eugenics and like the old people and, and, and mercy debt or like for saving money. And he didn't have any argument. And his, his response was to basically say that like morals and like the economy, like these are two different things. Right. So total cop yeah, out. I, I so don't cop out. Mm -hmm. I'm in um, I'm in pure maths. So I I talk to a lot of uh, STEM people, and this is pretty much the main tenet that that they believe in their worldviews is that everything is materialistic, everything is purely uh mechanistic. Um, love is just uh, chemicals in your brain. Uh, and it's completely unjustified. It's it's so yeah, I do that often to uh, take it to the logical conclusion. Like okay, this isn't really how you act. Uh, when you say love is a bunch of chemicals, you don't you don't do that to your child, right? So yeah, I understand what you're saying there. Yeah, no, they're always they're always fun. There, it's great opportunities to try and find new ways to kind of get in there and have a good you know, get to un unwound the knots. These are all knots. Jared, do you have a a question? Yes, sir. Hello, Dave. Greetings. <laughs> uh, I, re I read your article. It was very good, very good. I mean, it's intense, too. To be honest, I had to read it three times to really uh, get into it. And um, I was noticing 
Well, with Lang, that he seems to make, is that my mic doing weird things? No, you're fine. Okay, okay, I'm hearing feedback, but maybe it's something else. He seems to make certain useful observations. Okay, but his explanations of it go off weird. And I think because, you know, he's looking at it through his own mind. And because he doesn't really understand the creative process, he has to explain it in some other way. And you get this pessimistic outlook. Whereas yourself, because you have a better understanding of the creative process, it's much more optimistic. And anyway, I wrote down one thing you'd written in the article that I wanted to ask you about. You said, without conscious appreciation about the nature of the creative process, one may often be left with pseudo-creative novelty. And I, hmm. oh crap, that's, that's what we're living in today. That's our culture. That's what's on the street. Yeah, it, well, like the gatekeepers of our culture is because they control the money. It's, they don't promote art based on creativity but it's novelty so whatever is novel and basically it goes into what's weirder and I it's an interesting thing I was wondering if you um, had thought about that more you know the difference between creative art and just this novelty thing that we're stuck with you know with Hollywood and and the music industry there's there's no creativity there but i think you hit the point it's it's just novelty anyway i'd like your uh, further thoughts on that dave yeah i mean yeah the, the the creativity thing is another one right it's just like the the other question we just had again whether it's the mind like we're this the focus is more art but if you just slightly switch the focus we're talking about science right we're talking about investigation of scientific principles versus you know ideas as such um but i i feel like they're all very relate if we don't have a sense of like composition of like an image there's immaterial things a piece of art is an idea and it's usually it starts off with like a simple i think it's a simple image or it's a simple uh, line, right? A musical line, and we we investigate it, we we unpack it, we explore it in all sorts of different dimensions. We test it, right? We we try different uh, in different boundary conditions. We imagine the same thing uh, under different scenarios, and we get different perspectives. Or if it's music, we get different voices, and they start to cross, and they start to create new things, and we we develop it and we bring it together. But that's all assuming that we, um, you know, that we accept that there's something called development, which is also an immaterial thing, right? We're developing an idea, we're, we're thoroughly, uh, we're exploring it, and we're playing it out. But then naturally, right, it was in that quote from the creative process there, that's so the pre conscious is where the ideas come from. And, uh, you know, again, I, whether science or art, there's that inner voice, there's an idea, there's this something coming out of us. And, you know, if we poke people enough, if they deny that it exists, first of all, let's say they deny it exists, well, do they not have this inner voice or where are ideas coming from? Do they not have any original thoughts or anything? If so, where is it coming from? Uh, and then Kubi in the article, right, because that the pre-conscious throws out new ideas because it's able to create new free associations, which you need, as Dr. Kubi says, the psychoanalyst, whether in science or art, because we're looking to make new connections and da, da da But then he says, the conscious processes do have to come in after uh, to give it form, right? Because, and so you have a lot of this idea of like raw art or like, oh, it's so raw, or like, it's all just unfinished stuff. And you're like, no, I like it. It's like, it's more raw. And it's like, well, no, it's just not, uh, it doesn't mean, raw is equated with like authentic and original as opposed to like can or whatnot but so yeah it's like they're very much trying to be true to their 
they're they're very much trying to be true to their inner whatever. I shouldn't say their inner voice to say inner thing, uh, but they're not willing to compose it because they feel that's like enter the whole well-adjusted thing, right? It's these strictures that you're kind of imposing on it, and they're not free anymore. So freedom uh, and and necessity, right? Something that's bounding uh, the action uh, at all or whatever the music or the, the the development is, they feel that's limiting. And so, you know, it's more on to the irrational side. So art creativity gets perverted. And so the gulf between science and art becomes greater because science is coming at it from the other side, right? Trying to consciously craft a standard model of something uh, where art is, has these ideas that are coming out of nothing and supposed to become something. Um, so yeah, I think it's the, it's the bridge. We wanna be able to bridge the two, the world of the changing, of the material, of time, and the world of the unchanging, of the immaterial, of timelessness. And great art is when time and timelessness are truly wed, when time and eternity are wed, and then you get true timelessness. So we've got to, we've got to go at it from, from both angles. I think it's the same with science, right? We conduct an experiment, we try something under certain boundary conditions, then we need to try it under different boundary conditions and test it in a different way, where then we start to get an idea of a principle, right? And that they're under relativistic conditions, right? Under different conditions, things will behave differently, but there's a principle at work, regardless of you know the change in, in the boundary conditions. And what's a great story? If not, it's kind of the same thing, right? It's a timeless story. Homer and, the, you know, we're not living in Homer's age, but we can still get the timeless truths that come across that, even if the predicates, we're not sacrificing, we don't have hecatombs or we don't have, uh, you know, giant walls and cities fighting yet, but same truths come through. Yeah, it's like the the novelty, you have to apply, like you said, a principle to it. So if you don't apply a principle or test out a principle to it, it's it's just novelty. There's nothing there. Right. It's ephemera and it's gone, right? Once we've seen it, we're like, okay, moving on to the next thing. And that's our culture today, ephemeral. So unedifying. It's funny. I was uh, looking into a uh, a series of studies of Rembrandt and Vermeer's. Uh, just they're simple sketches and studies on color, and uh, like really, really underdefined um, works that they never intended to be public. They were just working on just exploring color in these little mini studies, you know, and underpaintings and, and what have you. And I remember being struck by the fact that these are like if. if you were to use the standards of the later impressionist or even uh, modern age, these would be like considered finished works mounted and, and selling for, you know, a lot of money in, you know, but these, these Renaissance painters never would have imagined or never would have imagined that anybody, that these would ever be public. They wouldn't want that because they had an idea of of this, you know, these being simple seeds that had to be grown, refined, and then finally made public. Um, <clears throat> but I think you have this, this reflexivity where it's like anything that comes from the conscious thought world of where reason exists is artificial and thus not creative. It is bad, as, as you alluded mm -hmm. to. And, and real art has to shake off the tyranny and the shackles of reason and formalism and just be that raw purity of, of spontaneity devoid of any reason or thought that could be considered a shackle, um, which then creates the, the type of situation that you just described pretty well. <laughs> it's a total bind. I mean, yeah. like it's sickness, right? Like we don't, it's not, we're not casting aspersions here, but like we can all, we're all, we all find ourselves in binds, like at certain points, like, but we're like, Hey, that's not, we want to, resolve that we don't make it our identity right we don't it say this is my art school 
that was my that was my bind as well. Like I was being pressured to pay homage and respect to what I knew in my heart of hearts was ugly, irrational uh, paintings, you know, post-impressionist, de deconstructionist works that were, I, I could say, ugly. And I think everybody in my class mm -hmm. believed that, but we were being pressured if we wanted to succeed in, the, in academia and become a respected artist, we had to find ways of spinning our minds to justify why these things were brilliant. And it's like, you're lying to yourself. And so you're like lying to yourself. And what is that doing for an a soul that yearns to be integrated and in harmony with yourself if you're learning to lie in order to, to be accepted in the norms of the society? So yeah, that, that's definitely a double bind to a huge degree. Really sick. Hence the need for double loops. Can you say a little bit more about that? Uh, well, the double loop is is the technical, I guess, framework for getting out of the double bind, uh, which is we first have to recognize that, you know, uh, there's a lie. There, there's some make-believe that we're engaged in. And I mean, this is the idea of um, the truth setting us free, right? Like in any sort of therapeutic situation, right, the person has to, they say, you know, there's the adage, we're only as sick as our secrets. Like that's a big thing in AA or any of these groups. Like if people who are struggling with addiction or any kind of, uh, you know, emotional sickness, that's their struggle, like the whole truth is healing for anybody who's been through any kind of trauma or anything like they have to confront, uh, you know, what happened to them. They have to revisit the truth. They have to revisit their own story. So going back to the story, our story has the truth. Our truth is in the, the, the story and our false self is in the make-believe stuff. And so we break that bind when we sort of force the truth to come out and the make-believe doesn't really stand a chance if we're humble and honest and we're just sort of letting things fall, letting the chips fall where they may, right? Like that's the whole point of truth. It's taking you places that you might not want to go. Dante didn't want to cross the wall of fire. You know, he really didn't want to, he was scared, uh, but there was a higher voice calling him and he tapped into that. And this was, this was how to get to the higher spheres was to, to be willing to listen to that a higher voice, inner voice. Uh, and so then people are at least present, right? And usually if if it's a bind, there there's it has to do with make-believe. It has to do with the delusion. So they're gonna have to grieve, right? You're gonna, it's sad to like realize that you were uh, involved in make-believe or that you were, that you were in love with an illusion, that you had been in an illusion or you had escaped one illusion and found out that you had just fallen into another illusion the whole time. Uh, and that's how people feel with the PSYOP stuff, right? And they get upset because it's like, oh, you mean Elon Musk isn't going to like save the world in democracy now? The guy who runs all the satellites for uh, the surveillance and, and Pentagon and developing those fancy chips, even though my computer still glitches regularly, but um, they can't be ready. But so this is all make-believe. And like the double loop is when we let that 18 wheeler hit us metaphorically, not the, the other, the bind would lead us to letting the real thing hit us metaphorically. And so then we sit in the grief and the truth washes over. And there's a transcendent feeling to that because actually the, the broke, the parts that had broken off, whether, you know, from perhaps decades and decades and decades ago, a lifetime ago, they all come back. Everything snaps back into place. Uh, and so the divided self starts to become whole again, right? And then there's, you know, the polishing and the, you know, and, and going forward and developing the new kind of outlook and, and practices, you know, practicing listening to that inner voice, practicing whatever, you know, depending on who it is and what they do, right? Everybody's got a different thing. Uh, but developing the more adaptive things that are allowing us to uh, to develop that 
that deeper authentic self, that, that creative spark, which each person has uniquely and which is itself only an intimation, right, of an overall uh, creative principle, right, which we're all in the image of. Which I, I mean, Quan, who's not here, I, I would have gotten him to chime in. Two people told me the same thing similarly, Quan and uh, another friend. So God is like the self with a capital S. And then we have our own authentic self. Because there's no self with the small s that isn't mixed in with, you know, some sort of, uh, I don't want to say contradiction, but we're in the material world. We're in the real world. Like nobody is a pure, we're not pure ether. We're not, you know, we're not disembodied spirits, uh, you know. So there's the only, only the self with the capital S is pure being, unencumbered, right, is the word I was looking for, by any sort of uh, contradiction or uh, whatever, imperfection or da da da. And so Nicholas of Cusa says that God is the absolute absence of all contradiction. That's God is the absolute absence of all contradiction. And so I like to think that every illusion that we remove, every time somebody removes an illusion about themselves, about others, about their heroes, you could say they're moving closer to God or to the universal self, to the authentic universal self and being. And that's exciting. That's, that feels refreshing just to hear, right? That we can move towards that. I believe even Max Planck had written in his philosophy of physics about um, how he made his discoveries into the quantum. Um, and he makes a point that I, he could not have done that had he not had a devout faith in the universal spirit that animates mm -hmm. all and which was also inside of him. And uh, people could say, oh, that's just the philosophical musings of, a, of an ivory tower philosopher. But it's like, no. He's actually somebody who made pioneering universal discoveries that have been proven to carry weight because they work and have given us power to resonate with the universe when applied in every domain. So it's like his, his words and thoughts on such matters carry much more weight than just a philosopher like a, like a Nietzsche or a Sartre who just sit around thinking about existentialism or, or being- Or a Sam Harris. Or Sam Harris, who never discovered anything, right? They just produced a lot of books and opinions, but they never discovered anything. So there's no resonance between their own personal inner world and the outer world. So why should we believe or pay 20 bucks for one of their books? <laughs> and, you know, <laughs> there's like nothing there. But that idea of the, the, the divine outer self the, and, the, and the inner, um, it's, a, it's a very strong thought, which I think leads into what Dasha, uh, my, or my touch on what Dasha is thinking about too. Um, Dasha put out a few thoughts in the chat box. Uh, but you're there right now, Dasha. So why don't you uh, you ask your thought or, or throw throw a, share your idea? Not sure whether my uh, question was answered already, but I will read it out. How do you explain when your thoughts are destructive? For example, limiting beliefs when you are in a depressive episode, etc. Your inner voice isn't always your best friend, or it might not be your true self. Right. Yeah, that's always an interesting one. I and I, I have a thought. I mean, because well, there's different voices, right? We're just saying, and we're not talking schizo here, but we're just talking normal. There's technically we're supposed to be in a dialogue with many things. Right. And there's the voice from the past. There's the voice from the future. Uh, I did like, um, I mean, if we're keeping this a condensed version, I mean, Lao Tzu, I believe, or it's in the Tao Te Ching, I believe. Uh, if you're depressed, you're stuck in the past. If you're anxious, you're stuck in the future. And naturally, when you come to the present and ground yourself and naturally, we have all sorts of different practices uh, to, to, to be in the present. Uh, you know, some more, uh, you know, some are just more at breathing, some are doing a hobby, right? Um, but yeah, I guess, I don't know if there, yeah, when there's nasty voices, right? Well, 
yeah, our, even when we know they're wrong, that doesn't usually make them go away, right? That doesn't, you're, let me show you why you're wrong, voice that's telling me like, this is a really shitty day or, or what, and maybe it is a shitty day. Um, I think it's getting excited about, well, there's different levels, right? I think there's obviously getting all the, right? Like the, there is the underworld, right? That Lang and Freud talk about. So like there's all that family dynamics past and, you know, how much of, are we, you know, acting out some kind of make-believe or something or keying off of something in the past? And so whatever, whether it's that feeling in the gut that we had a long time ago and it seems to come back in certain situations or it's a headache or it's a stomach ache or it's like back pain certain people have chronic back pain uh you know and they seem perfectly healthy but for some reason their back is just like a 60 year old even though they're like 30 um so naturally there's the bridging the double loop is sort of reconnecting with all those parts but then i think there's the bridger that gets the stuff out of the way so that we can tap into uh, the deeper self, the divine, and not in, in ourselves, and in that way, start to see it in others. I think that's important. And so part of, there's a grieving that, hey, we're in a pretty, there is, we are kind of in an underworld, you know? So it's, it's normal to uh, get demoralized by certain things. But I feel like those are, the, those are the knots, like those are, we want to get rid of our own, you know, we could say like our whole life is like a knot that we're trying to untangle or somebody said that, uh, that I was talking to. And then I was thinking, well, no, technically the point is we want to untangle our knot because once we do, actually we find out there's so many knots out there. Like the world is just a bunch of giant knots. Uh, so yeah, we want to untangle the knot in our life so that we can at least maybe contribute something uh, to these much more complex, you know, knots with like seemingly endless loops and splices and tied in all sorts of weird ways that make you want to like scream and like, how are we going to undo this knot? I don't know how to untie this knot. And but then, so we go deeper into ourselves. And I think there's always a trade off, you know, that's where charity, the idea of charity that, yeah, if we get too caught up with the self, switching the frame here, we forget that there's all these other selves and there's all these other things outside. So I guess it depends what kind of voice we have and we have to, you know, check in with all these different things uh, and, and, and see, yeah, wh what's the truth of the matter? But then, you know, what are the things that we need to do uh, to resolve these knots? But remembering that there are these simple truths, I guess. And how, yeah, how faithful are we staying to these simple truths? And just having fun trying to figure this stuff out, right? And playing with, playing around with it and trying different things and uh, habits, ideas. And uh, yeah, but Dante had this higher, I think the higher voice is important, right? He wouldn't have gone out of hell if he was just, sort of go walking around right if he was just sort of rambling through all those circles so we got to remember the 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 higher truth i think that that goes a long way or that that can be the saving grace and for a lot of people right they do a lot of therapy or they do a lot of this and they really want to get better but they're not able to let themselves uh have the the, the other thing kind of wash over them so they're stuck. I think that that's just to clarify. Korea, Dasha, what's yeah, go the ahead. Thing, just to clarify, what's the higher truth for you? Like the idea that there is a creator, and you are loved eternally, and you have a purpose. It's nothing that I can just like write. Uh, mm. uh, you know. A paper i wouldn't think about it that way but like let's let we just let us humble ourselves that there are certain simple truths we have a soul we have a mind uh everybody does how many people are aware of this deeper spark inside themselves how often are they in dialogue with it you know let's say you did you did something that you knew you shouldn't 
can do, right? But you, you still did it bad. Um, so clearly there was something there intervening. And, you know, we were just like, shut up. And we, we just, whatever, uh, we just went, uh, went about our business. And, but so that, I think that's, that's an intimation that there's something, uh, yeah, there's, there's, a, there's a deeper truth. And I wouldn't go, I would, I would say, I think the point is to explore that mystery, right? Because it's going to remain a mystery. It's not, it's never going to be spelled out. Like it's actually, the mystery is only going to become greater. That's actually the catch. The, the mystery will only become brighter and more obvious. And there will be no way to, to escape it. And I think that's the beautiful thing. Like the mysteries aren't going away. So let's get rid of all the bad stuff and the sickness so that we can uh, have fun and actually, you know, investigate the bigger questions, the bigger mysteries, mysteries of our souls, your soul, your friends, the universe. Throw out a, a follow up or Dasha, or do you do you want to let that settle in and just think about that? Yeah, and this needs to be settled in. Totally understand, and I think that yeah, it reflects a little bit of the idea that I I had gotten from a lot of Martin Luther King Jr.'s uh, speeches as well his oh, sermons. I heard many Martin Luther King Juniors. I was I use like you know several Martin Luther King Juniors. <laughs> um. But yeah, he, he'd often make the same point that you can only end up really loving yourself and finding yourself when you begin to go outside of yourself and help others. And so you've got this sense that you have to reframe your problem, like, because right. oftentimes it's not the solution to the problems are not found when one is just thinking about untangling the inner knots, but it's only when we go outside of ourselves and we start seeing similar problems being struggled with by other people that we find a bit of ourselves in them. And then we can look back in helping others in various ways that this can happen in, I think, in, there's, no, there's no single way this works. Uh, yeah. But we then are given, we, we create capacities to look upon our, ourselves from new eyes and a new, new perspective that is where we can get ideas for pathways and, and solutions um, that were not available prior, which is, I guess, also where the, the question of love comes in, right? Like, I was I literally, that, I, that was the big word that was in like, what about love? Well, because there's qualities, right, to this thing that we're saying has no, like, thing that we, we can't define. And yet, it has characteristics, has qualities. Artie, Artie Lang, he, sent, he sends, seems to do something similar to what you're saying, like revisiting trauma of the past. And I remember watching something on, like, Century of Self, where they were talking about Artie Lang's promotion of the primal scream to go back to your inner child and go through right. that. So, um, which is sort of similar, I guess, to revisiting the trauma, reprocessing it. But how would you say it's different from what you're talking about, the healthy approach versus the Artie Lang approach to tapping into your inner? Right. You know? Well, I think, well, I think that's Dante. It's, it's a good, it's a good, framework right this isn't like it's not a, a formula here we're not prescribing a formula but he's going through all these bad things right you know he's scared he's crying he's hurt he's tired um but he does have this guide he has a guide right and uh i mean that takes wisdom right to know that you know when you're listening to somebody like hey this person can teach me something or like they, they seem to know something that i don't and to kind of just let that. Um, so there's that humility goes a long way there. Number one, uh, that, all, that always seems to be a winner. <laughs> Humbling oneself, it's hard to go wrong with that one. Um, and yeah, then you meet some people or like, you know, you ever had a conversation with somebody and like they clearly didn't know what they were talking about or like they really thought they were smarter than they were. And, you know, it just, what do the young people say at SMH shaking my head, you know, cause they don't, they really think they're smart and they're just like, you, you have no idea. That's lack of humility. We could say it's stupidity, but 
they could humble themselves. They're not being true to themselves. So I, I say that because so a guide, a trajectory, you know, Dan, there was a trajectory for Dante that, that you know, the world was not just like smorgasbord. Uh, there was a structure to the universe and there is a structure to our universe. Uh, number one, um, for the Lang thing, it's like dissolving, it's splintering, it's breaking apart, right? So that because you're, you're bounded in all sorts of unnatural ways, shatter everything pretty much or go nuts, primal scream, uh, break down into your most primal self. And then you can put the pieces back together. But it's like, I think this is, this is a fun, this is where like, I think, you know, LaRouche would talk about insight from great art. Like that same idea treated slightly differently will give you a very different universe. Will give you two very different universes, depending on how you're thinking about the splintering and putting yourself back together. But this is how they also studied cults, right? Like, why are all these, why were there all these like cults that always seem to have people monitoring them or something? We hear the book I'm reading is ridiculous. <laughs> this book is a banger. Uh, Chaos, Charles Manson, the CIA, and the secret history of the 60s. You know, it's a lot, there's false memories, a big thing on false memories in there. Uh, how to create false memories, false traumas. Uh, and so, right, so the people who splinter and they may have a cathartic sort of feeling of letting everything out, but then the question is what are the adaptive or new maladaptive thoughts that are introduced? Because that's when the person is vulnerable, right? Their, their authentic self, their pain, hurted self, wounded self, which they're sort of exposing, because they want to get better and they want to, you know, have, be true to their authentic self. Uh, what happens when you start to bring in new ideas that are maybe sound good, right? They're, they're much prettier than the other illusion, or they seem to solve the problems that the other illusion that just shattered, uh, you know, had sort of created for you. But then you go the other way. And so that that moment of splintering and, and, and catharsis is, is a is a very uh, key point for introducing new ideas. People are vulnerable. It's normal. Um, so it's also dangerous, right? If you're a crazy sociopathic, you know, army of Tavistockians looking at how do we uh, introduce new suggestions uh, in, in times of where people are uh, induced to experience trauma, whether real or just made up and, and largely created through language and, and, and make-believe, you know, insurrections, governments being taken over, and it's like a couple of like weird people, dudes, and like opening gates and letting a bunch of other people in, you know? And then you're scared your whole country is gonna get taken over. And so we have to, you know, put people in jail who are saying things that are deemed bad by the security state. So it's easy to create traumas too for people. Uh, that's what they studied. In studying trauma, you learn how people develop trauma. And so you can you can make it. Which also helps facilitate the malleable um, victim, mass victim mentality and victim identity, which makes people um, equally manipulable and malleable as well, right? When you feel like you've got a grudge against white European males or something, yeah. or men or people of a different skin tone, all of a sudden you can create a whole society of resentment at war with itself, not really seeing their fellow human being in somebody who looks a different way or a different gender, a different color, yeah. which is where we're naturally at home and, and at one with ourselves. When we look for the universal, we can't do that under this critical race theory logic of like, oh, I'm a victim. I've got, I'm, I'm reliving the trauma of 19th century ancestors who have been abused yeah. and exploited and I'm living it all again now. Yeah. It's like, how do you grow when you're in that state? And then you introduce crazy new ways, right? Of like, they introduce new crazy ideas as, as remedies. Is that why people have to like repent or whatever? So many things, yeah, all sorts of things. Um, Kelly, have you been waiting for a while? 
Uh, hi, Dave. Hi. Um, yeah, we were talking, um, you know, about like all these problems. Um, you want to break, break, break the binds in the society of our, you know, we all have our, our problems like schizophrenia and things like that. Um, I was just kind of playing with the idea of of uh, like we have a public life and we have our private lives and um i don't know i've been i heard it said somewhere and i kind of try and practice it is kind of like coalescing my public life and my private life and trying to combine it not necessarily join it all together there's always a private part of me i guess and um yeah, I mean, when you go to the bathroom, we don't need to go. Yeah, there. yeah. <laughs> There's private. We're not denying that. Yeah. But like, yeah, I, what I'm trying to get at is, like, when I'm when I'm speaking in public, uh, there's like, if I hold back some things I do in secret that maybe really shouldn't be secret, it would reflect on, say, you, by the things that I say and how I say it, um, even the things that I don't say. And mm -hmm. it, it could reflect on like other people around me as well as myself. And it could actually create, you know, um, some of these problems that all of us are having. So if we kind of like try and, um, uh, I don't know how to put it, be more honest, be more honest with ourselves when we're in our public lives, it would help others with these illnesses perhaps. Yeah, I mean, it, I mean, it's one of those simple truths and just, yeah, it's not going to get old, right? That that thing's not going away. Um, I mean, you know, Jordan Peterson, who, you know, we popular, popular psychologist guy. And I mean, you know, we all, he's our fellow countrymen. We, you know, we have an affinity for him. One thing he said, you know, tons of things I, I'm annoyed, especially these days that I hear. But I mean, uh, you know, he'd always say, don't lie. You know, like that's one of the things rules for life or 12, like don't lie. And I, I did think about that one. And I remember being younger and being around, uh, you know, friends or like their families. And there's all the little white lies. And I remember the Rushis talk about that too. Like all these, that's one of the things, right? It, it, these suburb, that like archetypal suburban suburbia sort of like they've all got these little things going on. And like they say one thing about a person and they say another um, and then it's like people think, oh, they're just lying outwardly, right? As if these aren't the people who also have a capacity to lie to themselves. They're like, no, I just lie to like other people. I don't, I don't lie to myself. Like but in a way, that's a split personality, isn't it? Sure. I mean, we can all be split at times, right? But then it, it's like a practice where they're they're just it's always it becomes a practice right and we become what we practice i mean that's there's a decent um you know again like it's not about uh we're not talking about uh uh ethereal forms here but like naturally if we're telling white lies if it's a white lie why tell it like it's just white <laughs> you know it's like a small lie why, why that's even worse right because it's like well you still feel just to like tidy up reality all the time we're just kind of gonna as a habit, right? There's certain things, yes, you look nice today. You know, you don't have to say, hey, you, like, that's not what we're saying. But, um, you know, so, th but they're, they believe in the power of magic. They believe in the power of make-believe. And they believe in using make-believe to sort of get ahead. And they learned that somewhere. And so, I like the idea. I don't like make believe. So I guess that's how. Like, if I'm making make believe, I'm like, okay, that's make believe. Like, we all have a story, and stories are complicated, right? Stories, uh, you know, are 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 juicy and full of all sorts of things. You know, what a piece of work man is. Uh, but then there's make believe, which is literally kind of like trying to obscure things actively you know, practicing the art of obscuring things for yourself and for others. Um, so yeah, no, we all got to discover our own story and that takes time. And uh, 
you know, Caitlin Johnstone in one of her poems that I like, she says uh, it's her to-do list and it has, it's all a bunch of different to-dos and some are like mop, some are discover new ways that I've been fooling myself, you know, discover new ways that I've been this myself. Um, so yeah, we do always want to discover uh, these, these new things. If we have illusions, right, we want to get excited about that, um, you know, because how can we battle the magicians, right, the masters of illusion, if we ourselves are in love uh, with our own illusions, right? It becomes hard to battle the magicians if, if, you know, we just have our own different set of illusions that we like, which is what most of this tribal political stuff is. So I think feeling good about removing the illusions and getting closer to the real thing, like having that as something we hunger for, um, I mean, that feels healthy. You know, that's soul food. And so we, we need that too. Or, or even our, our secrets, the, the things where we kind of hide or covet from others. Right, well, they, we're only as sick as our secrets, right? I mean, it doesn't mean announce, uh, you know, the flip side, just to flip it, Tim Dillon said something interesting in one of his podcasts, like where it's gone the other extreme, where like everybody has to like spill everything and there's no mystery. And like, so we know all the Hollywood celebrities, like, yeah, you guys are all fucked up. Like everybody's sick. Okay. And like, there's no mystery. Like we know what you're doing on vacation and like what <laughs> tartar you're eating for lunch, you know, like you're, we're in your kitchen. Uh, it's, you need a little mystery, right? Mystery is good. Um, but yeah, so the, the yeah, line but between make believe just not not keep them separate though. Like there's like what was the word coalesce kind of like not necessarily. No, but you know what? Yeah, it depends what the, I'm just saying. Like yeah, you don't need. It's not about everybody. Sort of, uh, you know, like people have all sorts of health, right? Healthy. You don't have to reveal your health issues, right? Whether mental or physical or whatnot. Uh, so that's not what we're talking about, right? We're talking about like, yeah, like secrets, you know, like the make-believe stuff that we use to create these fake lives and these fake appearances to manipulate people. That's different. And there's way too much of that, you know? And like, sure, we're, we're not aware of certain things that we're doing or we just don't know how to uh, think about it or what what's a more adaptive thing. Like these things take time, sure. Um, you know, it's not a shame thing. I, I guess we, we do have to be careful for that because the shaming stuff usually gets people to hang on to their secrets because they hate themselves more and more. And the longer they, they have them or like they, they know they're going to they're gonna be shamed or feel ashamed if they deal with it. So they push it down more and they become even more like demons from hell, right? Because there's the split. And so you get this with all the fundamentalists, right? Like the, you know, they're uh, some of the people that I know who are like super religious or that I, I've met, right? And like, these are like, these are the demons from hell. As Tim Dillon would say, these are the people that are going hog wild um, where you're like, okay, like everybody has problems, but then you hear stories like that's a lot. Like that's a lot. <laughs> um, and yet they have these convictions, but it's because there's the shame and it's all compartmentalized. So they're not in the same emotional state when they're demon from hell as when they're in shame state and they're sinners. So it's a divided back and forth. So that's where the double loop uh, is important to just bring it all together. And then there's the higher on a spiritual level of kind of doing the same thing, getting in touch with our deeper inner voice. And that becomes us. So it's definitely multi-pronged, you know? I don't think there's like a, it's a practice. I was, uh, I was struck by um, an, an article, I think it was on Scientific American, but this is a big thing in the last decade or so, especially um, that was analyzing how you can know a, a sociopath. And, you know, there's a lot of like scientific studies or pseudoscience. The eyes. Yeah, the eyes, it's only eyes, you know? And, and they have like different ticks and tricks and like, how do you identify the sociopath 
Um, and the studies that they're publishing are really, really, you could see dishonest, but they're, they're using just numerical data to try to map qualitative phenomena that you could see these experts don't understand where they're trying to say like, oh, we've just discovered one out of 12 people are sociopaths because they're born with no access, access to conscience, one out of 12. And so you could imagine like people who read this stuff and believe it are walking around the grocery store thinking that they're surrounded by sociopaths. You know, if right. you've got more than 12 people in your, or 12 people or more in your family, likely somebody's a sociopath. And it's like, um, you, you can see how this sort of thing would emerge when you've got a whole society that, that becomes disassociated, right? Where like right. you said, it's, people are inclined more and more to not develop a sense of how to look upon themselves from the outside while at the same time having an, an inner authenticity. They, they're, they're divided selves. They're, they're trying to figure out how do I put on a mask? How do I create a construct that will be uh, accepted by people that I'm, I'm, are in my tribe? Um, and they, they won't necessarily, they're not sociopathic, but they just don't know how to do it. So they're just you can see that there's a rigidity. There's a lot of like maybe fake fakeness behind it. Like, okay, am I putting on the right expression on my face? Am I, some are better, some are worse at it. Yeah. Diagnose this as being, oh, they're sociopathic. They're all born with no conscience. Uh, that, that is such a crazy sick fallacy, right? <laughs> it's a. Uh... And they're just doing it more and more. Like the, the maid stuff is the thing that really um, like you have, um, treatment resistant, what did they call it, got it? Treatment resistant depression or like treatment resistant this. So they're just coming up with new words, right? So they're just all these incurable uh, problems. Like everything is becoming an incurable problem uh, that just requires some sort of like either maid, either meds, uh, either, you know, or like, you know what I mean? It's just, they're, they're just, uh, yeah, they're just, we're just coming up with things to like, are these people really sociopathic, half of the ones that are being modeled and, and profiled? Or were they born, in, you know, how much of it were, you know, or can they get, can they develop that relationship with their, with a, their deeper self? Like, how do you do that? It's not clear that all these psychiatrists that, you know, these famous ones, uh, let's say, like, it's not clear that they really knew, right? It's not like they were really good at, you know, Artie Lang's family life was uh, unfortunately very dark. Uh, you know, he was a very big drinker, uh, you know, son killed himself, daughter's a schizophrenic in mental institutions, he has more than one, like he leaves one family as another, uh, like these were very disturbed people. Um, so like, do they really know? So if, if the experts who are doing the modeling and all that, like, well, who's doing the curing, like, or the people that are supposed to be doing the curing, like, how do they think and what are what are they really like, you know, because is their expert opinion the thing that's shaping all these studies? There's wild stories out there, right, about some of these, like, uh, mental health professionals and whatnot. Like, there's good people out there, but there's a lot of wild stuff, and universities are just churning out, uh, you know, a lot of, like, intellectual garbage, these crazy theories. Like, imagine that. It's peer-reviewed. Oh, I guess these people are just sociopaths. These people are just treatment-resistant. Like, that's a nice way to make the problem go away. The universe is just irrational. It's not because our model of the Big Bang is not good. It's just because the universe is like a statistically irrational thing. Like, talk about like deep psycho spiritual binds. Mm. You know? If you're a problem solver, the only way to deal with such a, such a, reality that you you're expected to believe in is to support some form of uh of eugenics of some sort because you know if it's if you're genetically wired if it's in your genes and we could predict who's going to become sociopathic um is to like you know intervene on if it's incurable they can't develop an inner dialogue right if, if we assume yes. that all of these things are just uh built into the wiring of humanity then you only, I mean, the only solution left for you is, I guess, some form of, yeah, eugenics to kill off the, the sociopaths or, or sterilize those who will produce sociopathic offspring or something like that. It doesn't leave you much space to actually heal. 
yeah, I mean, hey, if we want to entertain that idea, okay, well, let's start with the ones who are likely to most do the most harm. So the people in positions of most power, right? So CEOs, government officials, uh, finance and all that. Let's give them the test first, see how many of them uh, pass this sociopath uh, test. And uh, okay, we'll take it from there. I mean, if obviously not, but if they want to play that game, sure. We got a, that was a, a thought experiment. That was not a prescription. That's an important disclaimer. Yeah, we don't necessarily condone that. No, oh. we don't. Because we believe in healing. Exactly. And doing the double loop instead of going crazy. Uh, we, so we have Yuri and then we have Paul. Um, and then I think, Dave, do you have like a cutoff? Around I'm not, no, I'm not in a rush today. I, I already, okay. yeah. Right, let's see how it goes. So uh, Yuri. Bill, by the way, wrote, if you're in a hole, stop digging. That was, I appreciate that. Timeless wisdom. Uh, Yuri, you're still on mute. Uh, you hear me now? Mm -hmm. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, I was, uh, this isn't a new thought, but I was wondering if one can think without the use of words. And uh, I guess that would be what meditation is about. I don't know. I'm not very good at meditation. But if you can think without using words, wouldn't that drop you down into a sort of subconscious realm? Wouldn't that put you in the realm of feelings and emotions? That's and wouldn't that be sort of a way uh, to find yourself or find something? Who knows what? You might want to watch out. But wouldn't that be a, a method of finding something where you can make new connections? Uh, more I can't where you make new connections and uh, and then bring that forth into a more conscious realm to create art. I guess that's kind of what you said in your article, but I'm wondering what you think. Has anybody, yes. tried, to think? And Has no. anybody tried to think without using words? I can't do it. Well, there's a word for that. It's called Good. felt thought. <laughs> there's a felt word for that? <laughs> there's a word for that. They're called felt thoughts and actually uh, I think I only briefly meant I had longer parts of it, and then, but it, it didn't work for the essay. But children learn through felt thoughts, right? Like the well, first, you know, the first thing, like when you're when we're raising children, right? Like you, right? You tell the truth, and like you, good job. Like you say thank you, you say please, and like there's an emotion tied to all these things, right? And emotions are not bad technically, right? And again, they don't model healthy systems very much. All the experts. But like the point of the emotions is that whether we're anxious or we're afraid, they're, they're getting us to move, right? They're getting us to, to take a certain kind of action, their prompts. And so children, before they can fully develop their, uh, their higher faculties, they're largely learning through felt thoughts, right? Like what's being communicated to them is they, they feel different things based on what you're saying. If they're happy, sad, good, bad, shame, or that, and that's why uh, where either children see themselves either in reflected glory or disgrace shadows, right? Like that's that's the initial uh, choice. And so uh, if that gets screwed up or people start, you know, parenting is kind of not super adaptive and this starts to get mixed up. So you learn, right? That's the thing, uh, because What's the, all, a lot of the brainwashing today, they really are trying to treat it's infantilizing people, the behavioral science, because it's all about having the right felt thoughts for the right image. So like yeah. environmentalism, right? It's green grass and green trees and clean air. You, you all want that, right? You don't want to be like in battery cages, like in a city with a lot of like angry people, right? You want to be free. Uh, so it's the affectation and that's how children learn right and that's why if you know children have to revisit uh, the past or anybody who revisits their story right the thought the feeling that they have tied to a certain memory or emotion may need to change right and the bind is that there's always the same feeling that comes with the same image and there's no way around it and there's all these binds in the, the Lang book, right? There's so many of them. It's an interesting book, knots, right? They're all knots. So, you know, they're, did you read the article? Should I read this bind to you if you didn't read it as a fun experiment? 
Uh, yeah, I read it, but go ahead and do it again. Right. Some of these things are actually, they could be fun to dramatize, to be honest, the, the knots. Um, uh, right, so this is a this is one of the knots, right? My mother loves me, I feel good. I feel good because she lo loves me. I am good because I feel good. I feel good because I am good. My mother loves me because I am good. My mother does not love me. I feel bad. I feel bad because she does not love me. I am bad because I feel bad. I feel bad because I am bad. I am bad because she does not love me. She does not love me because I am bad. Now Matt, we could go on and on, right? But that's a bind. So the image and the thought, and he has a lot of them because he's studying schizophrenics. And so he often, mm -hmm. he got in trouble for saying, you know, like the uh, mothers and the daughters or the sons, there's something going on there. And uh, so he has all these different binds, some, but so there's a felt thought. And so the, because there's no words for it, we don't necessarily know why we have the feelings that we do in certain, like we're, we're just annoyed or upset. Certain things bother us. Um, certain people spaz out in different situations. And you're like, why is this person totally spazzing out and like losing their mind? Uh, you know, seemingly over something that's kind of minor, and yet they're losing their mind. Uh, so there's a felt thought there, right? And there is no words. And putting words on it, putting a name on it, is really like the number one uh, first step, right? We have to be able to right. call things by their name. And so we do need language. That's how we make distinctions and identify things. Point of truth is, you know, to call things by their name. That's what Confucius said himself, right? The rectification of terms. When he was asked if he were uh, to become the governor of the state, what's the first thing that he would do? And he said, I would rectify the terms, right? Because we, to the degree things are not called by their name, there's going to be confusion. Punishments won't be handed out properly. Uh, you know, proprieties will suffer. Uh, and therefore, music will suffer. And if the music will suffer, the people will become nastier and if the people become nastier you know laws won't be followed and it's all just going to go so we have to rectify the terms and so the felt thoughts is putting the right name on the right thought and you know oftentimes yeah people are upset but is are they really upset you know the rage people who have rage they say often beneath the rage is deep sadness right? and you'll see that people who have like I don't think it's a word, but rageaholics, you know, they really get mad. It's usually because they're powerless, right? And maybe they were abused in some way. And so when they feel that sense of like things are not going right, they, they lose their mind, right? They go into an altered state uh, because they're, they're just, they're snapping. That's a, there's a felt thought, right? That we need to put new names and words uh, on these things and then start to work backwards. So we need felt thoughts though. Plato talks about this in, in what I started to read in the laws, you know, like children to like dancing, let's say, or singing, uh, but they shouldn't also sing well or dance well, but it should be good. It should be good singing and good dancing and they should feel good about doing dancing and singing that is actually good. Not just doing it well, but that the thing that they do well is good. And so he's actually, I was thinking about it, having done all this work, and he's, it, sound, it might sound like he's trying to brainwash ki kids. We need to make them feel good about, but remember, they're children. So they need the right habits and practices um, you know, and forms of play and that the right felt thoughts are put in the right place to give them the basic frameworks and models to then cultivate their higher faculties, right? Like we're supposed to give people a good start. We're not supposed to set everybody back, right? Like the way our society is functioning and the way the families that Lang studied function, like everything is setting, it's just setting people back. It's just crippling people. So felt thoughts are important, no doubt. Yeah. Okay. Uh, oh. Those 
Paul still there? Yeah, Paul, you're there, but you're you're on mute. I could always read your question if you'd like. Yeah, I'll read your question. Uh, so Paul asks, if we have many voices, what are the characteristics of the voice of our higher self? Simple question. This one. I mean, I don't know. We could take a descriptive approach here, like or just say, well, it's kind of faint. You know, it's kind of just whatever. Uh, yeah, I don't know. That would be one way to approach it. Um, it comes and goes. I mean, we could say that, right? Um, sometimes it seems like we can, it can be, it's there longer. Uh, we forget it or yeah, it seems like it's gone away or something. Um, but no, I think that's where the practice comes in. I guess or we try and tap into it, the more we get to know what our own inner voice is, you know, I don't know what, uh, you know, I can't tell you what your inner voice is like, who knows? Right. But it's it's probably has something to say. And I guess that's the great one of the great paradoxes or the mysteries of it all is that it can teach us things that we don't already know. How the hell is that possible? How could something inside us teach us things about the world, about reality, the universe, about ourselves that we don't already know? What is the nature of this of this agency, this thing such that it knows things that we don't? And, you know, whether it's science or art, right? Science is new ideas are coming from somewhere. They're occurring somehow. But there is that primal mystery that they're occurring. Like they're real. And the inner voice is real. Um, so I guess I would think more what happens when we do listen to it, right? Instead of describing it, what happens when we do follow the inner voice? What happens when we listen to the muses? Right. What happens when we listen uh, to that echoes from the higher spheres, if, we, if you will? Yeah. How do we change? I guess that would be the question. And maybe to know it that way. What effect does it have on us? Thanks. That's helpful. Sometimes just asking the question differently, it, it gives you a whole new set of, of tools to play with. Mm -hmm. um and i like that yeah like what does it do what, is, what are the effects of it versus what is it in, in its detail i like that a lot um that sort of also plays into a question dasha just threw out she said I, she's heard that some people don't have an inner dialogue and i would add to that um how, how would you recommend people since there's so many barriers that have been artificially placed into our pathway in the constructs of cultural norms that we've been born into that prohibit the development of this inner loving dialogue, what are some tools you'd recommend uh, that people could think about as they develop a better, uh, either develop an inner dialogue that they don't know how to have or enhance and improve upon their inner dialogue with their higher self um, and make it make that process better? What are some some te techniques and ways that you could throw out there? I mean, yeah, as I, I don't know, I, I it's weird to just make it like yeah, we don't want it to. I, well, the first I was just thinking about the first thing about some people don't have an inner voice. I think I I brought that up once, or Matt, I was bringing that up with you. I mean, this is a fine story. You said you didn't have an inner voice till you were like twenty or something. I remember you saying something like that, or like you did it very underdeveloped. I wouldn't say it was non-existent, yeah. but it was certainly. But yeah, not nothing. But, Nothing that was useful. <laughs> say that. Yeah, but that seems that seems kind of. I mean, that's that's pretty standard, right? And I so because when I hear what uh, Dasha just said, it's like, well, number one, who are these people that are making that uh, assessment? Like, what does that even mean? Like, how did they test that? <laughs> what did they do? Did they just ask these people who never really had like a real dialogue with themselves, or maybe they're just more kinesthetic and my second theory some people do maybe they're more there's different kinds of learners like i'm auditory so i do i like concepts i like to hear things explain and i was reflecting i just heard a story and it was a podcast and the guy's a comedian and he's saying his dad the old school you know conservative kind of like tough guy dads and he was showing him how to like i think paint the car or something and he's like you do it like this and he shows him 
And then he's like, okay, now you do it. And the guy who's telling the story of the community is like, I didn't know what to do. Like, like wh what's the concept? I don't understand. But clearly there are people that are more kinesthetic and visual, right? Or if you think of like the mechanic and the shop, as they'd say, like in, in um, like, so there's different kinds of learners. I think that plays into it. So some people feel things more and have a more felt thought. Some people visualize. Uh, this was one of the things that the NLP, uh, Richard Bandler talked about like in therapy sessions, if you have couples, um, you know, therapists, we have the famous cliche, like, how do you feel about that? And one of them might be like, what do you mean? Like, I don't get it. Like, well, how do you feel about that? And then he said, if you change it, you say, well, what does it sound like? You know, like, what is what you're upset about? Like, what do you hear? What does it sound like? And they're like, well, it sounds like they're just da -da -da. all of a sudden the gears are switched and the person is just sort of, he's able to articulate. He's able to put it together. For some people, you ask them to explain it and they don't know. And you say, well, how does it feel? And they're able to give you a pretty like clear description of what's going on. So there are different modalities, auditory, kinesthetic, visual. Those are the three main so, I mean, I'm sure the inner voice stuff that that could be uh, affected, right? Some people are less articulate speaking wise, but they're technically very good, right? They're fixing cars. They're doing mechanical mechanics stuff that I will not ever, you know, I'll die not knowing how to do, you know, 5% of this stuff. But it's just because it's not, you know, we do have talents and we do have inclinations and that's what makes each person unique. So the know thyself, I guess, is an important one when we're talking about the, uh, the inner voice because it is different and we are different. So knowing thyself, I mean, that takes, takes a lifetime. I mean, we're always gonna know more because if our self, small s, is an intimation of the self, big S, we're never going to know everything, everything about the big S self. And, but we can really only know the big S self, at least experience wise by investigating our own small S self. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's, and that's the mystery, right? There's that's, that's always going to be there. That's not something that's going away. So I think embracing that as a, long journey like it's not ending it's not going away that's another one probably right because we often think of things as hard and we're like it's going to take a really long time but then it's like well wait actually like it is going to take a really long time like that's the point and so we can start to have fun doing whatever it is we're doing because these things are all going to take a very long time for some reason i've I felt that one's always comforting you kind of switch it it's like the more serious you are about like, yeah, this is bad, but like, this is very hard or whatever, or this is very challenging. But then it's like, maybe that's a good thing. You know, if we can sort of have fun with that, that it is hard. Uh, and so, boy, we're probably going to learn a lot if we actually really get in there. Uh, it's got to be helpful for us and likely for other people, right? If we're kind of putting our hearts into it, we'll probably come, you know, out of these different uh, uh, avenues and recesses with some kind of, of knowledge that we didn't have before that could be useful for, for others. So I feel these are all different uh, ways to explore the potentialities. There's a, a couple of very interesting, or I think useful comments in the comment section too that might add a little bit to this uh, this discussion, uh, because uh, you know we're often since we're babies, we're always looking to the outside world and trying to find role models in some way to figure out how does this work, right? This thing called being human, and um, if we're lucky, some you know we're born into a, a healthy family. We we find some good role models, some good mentors, people with wisdom. Um, unfortunately, many of us don't really access that stuff, so we don't have a lot of positive role models of beauty of, of like healthy mature yeah. um, optimism which is not foolish optimism like like the obama you know hope and change that's that's yeah. rooted in nothing but 
but real, real, like reasonable optimism that recognizes the existence also of evil, which is very hard to come by. But I think when you, like Monty wrote something that I liked, oh, he said, performing Handel's uh, Hallelujah Chorus again uh, this season. I guess, Monty, you're, you're performing in a, in a chorus, uh, a wonderful means to experience the harmony of the universe amongst the many and transcending space-time boundaries. I like that idea, but it's true if you actually listen to somebody like a, a, a beautiful, mature soul like a Handel, listen to some of the, the creative works that he did, mm. which came from a, a, very, a place of authentic honesty and love that was sort of the source out of which he, he drew for his creative works. And then my mom, like that's one good thing, like listen to just good quality um, products like that, uh, that yeah. came from authentic springs. Um, another example of that was my mom. She wrote something. To Hi, me. Matt's mom. She's there. I'm sure she can hear you. She wrote uh, St. Augustine. I, I lost her message, but she said, Hi. read St. Augustine's Confessions. Oh, there you are. Hey, mom, you want to wanna say your thought? No, I was just saying that to get to know yourself, that's a good one to start with. With the Confessions St. Augustine's Augustine. Confessions. Yeah, it's right. excellent. And also Victor Frankl's meaning man's meaning for man's search for meaning i've heard good things about that i i'm curious amazing amazing it was written in the 40s after he got out of the concentration camp he used right. the he was a psychiatrist right and he used the concentration camp as his testing ground as his laboratory and what right. look after and it's sure. he was in the concentration camp he was not a, a nazi german no, psychiatrist no. he was in the concentration no, he camp he was another patient <laughs> That's he was another patient yeah but uh no it, his conclusion is that a lot of the problems we have with depression and is hopelessness because we're living in the past and we see no hope it's lack of hope is was his conclusion of the problem or one of the problems anyway. So I find him a very good read. Absolutely, yeah, I'll have to, I've been meaning to look into it because I was looking at the other existentialism uh, stuff, which it's like, it's it's super sticky though. The, yeah, the existential. But I know he was a bit more, but that like more of leaning towards the hope and the, like- yeah. I can lend but, you the book. <laughs> yes, I mean, I'm interested. Um, I, and I was thinking though, as I heard, Technically, the difficult situations, I think, and my friend said this, uh, my poet friend John, about art. Like, if we're really going to learn, we want to take the difficult cases, right? You, you, you actually, the difficult cases is where we learn everything, right? And so it's the, it's the lack of people challenging some, themselves with the more difficult case scenarios, case situations, right? Whether it's schizophrenia in the, in the mental health or like these, these, like deep traumas people that have really uh, gone through stuff and that was one thing I was curious about I knew people who went through uh I looked for that like uh that worse made it to the other side yeah. and how well, in God's name did these people make it to the other side well, and just has... have... continue yeah go ahead no, I was just going to say when he had his practice as one of the early psychiatrists in Germany many of his patients were the wealthy who were suicidal. So he would listen to the stories and he would often wonder what made them suicidal because I know people who have gone through much worse and they're not suicidal. So what makes the difference, right? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's teaching moments in all these things, right? Yeah. There's a lot, there's wisdom everywhere, but naturally, yeah, we want to look for the difficult cases. Difficult, yeah. Uh, and whether it's art, psychology and try and unravel those knots and then we become freer to sort of play around with in all sorts of different situations where like okay like there are all these different possibilities let's try this let's try that um yeah and, and being able to face those difficult uh, bigger questions or paradoxes you know comparing a a rembrandt to a vermeer you know, like some of the best of Rembrandt, some of the best of Vermeer, like how are they different? Uh, or my poet friend John was saying like, which one's better technically? Is that is that a fair question? But you could, what are they doing? What's different? And to really get in there and try to put a word, a name on things, on all these different things, uh, there's a lot of insight. 
to, in, in trying to unravel these, these very difficult big knots. Um, so yeah, I thought about, I, I thought that I had another thought, but I don't think it was, I don't know where it came from. It's, I don't know that it's related. Somebody probably said something earlier, but. I have to say Thanks it. for your presentation. <laughs> Uh, thanks for thanks for key, thanks for key, uh, jumping in and the book. Thank you for the book that you will lend me. Uh, my sure thought, that, that thought, yeah. Uh, right. So it's we we talk about people not being able to uh, recognize the evil or like the bad, right? They're not willing to look at the bad, like the really bad, like the really really bad. Um, and is it really because they're not able to look at the really really bad? or the really, really, really bad? Or is it because they really don't have an understanding? They don't really understand the good. What they lack is an understanding of the nature of the good, how it works. And so obviously evil looks overwhelming. You know, there's this famous couplet, uh, gosh, and I'm not, I'm not good with quotes. Uh, Drink deep uh, from the Pyrian spring. A little knowledge is a dangerous thing. And Tim Dillon, he gave a great example, the QAnon people, right? Who were just kind of quote unquote normie going about their lives. And then they find out about like Epstein pedophile islands and presidents and da-da-da. And their brain melts, right? And so then they're like, yeah, uh, he did a sketch where he's like, he's the JFK tour guide. And the guy's like, JFK is not dead. He's in a bunker with Princess Diana and they're going to be there. Trump is going to be made president and they're going to be there for the inauguration. And da -da -da, he's going, but they're, they sound schizo, right? The, uh, some of the, the crazier conspiracy theories. And he was just having fun with that. But it's like, because the mind melted because they didn't know how to deal with the evil, uh, they went into the make-believe world, right? They disassociated. I think somebody said something about the camps and disassociation. And um, so, yeah, there it, but it's the lack of an understanding of the good or discovering it within oneself. So obviously, and others, again, if people can't see it in others, it's probably because they can't see it in themselves, right? That's, that's always a thing too, right? Because at worst you say, wow, all these people are not aware of the good that's inside them. Like what a waste of a life. Like, sure, we could say that. There seems to be a lot of uh, wasted talent right? Lots of skilled people. I mean, I, I find I'm always kind of surprised that like people have all sorts of talents. Uh, people can be very thoughtful where maybe you thought at first they were a bit more superficial, but you just poke a bit and like they have it, they have an authentic self. They just, they're maybe not that used to it, but you, you, you said something that kind of prompted them to kind of uh, share something or say something that uh, yourself uh, surprised and impressed by and uh, yeah so that it's always there but if we can't see it in ourselves naturally how are you going to see it in others and same thing with the and on a deeper level so if that good is not clear then the evil stuff the like the really 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 bad stuff is is definitely challenging so we have to go right so the difficult cases we do have to go all the way in a certain sense, uh, with ourselves and in, in our, our the epistemological journey, we want to deal with the big mouths, the big problems. Like you can't drink a bit from the Pyrian spring and start looking at all sorts of stuff that's like pretty intense, you know? Like these are knots with all sorts of loops and splices. Like you, you kind of want to have a good appreciation for nuance and discernment if you're going to you know, have at it. And Schiller has a great poem on that, the, the veiled image at Saiz. It's a fun one. Is it? The veiled image at Saiz. He wants to know the, like the veil, it's the secrets of everything is behind the veil. It's this eager youth and he wants to know. And the priests, he asked them like if they ever looked behind, they said, nope. And he's really eager and he breaks into the, pyramid thing and he really, he really wants to see what's beside the veil because he'd been studying a bit of philosophy and he's like yeah but it you know I've done the work 
and well, they just found him like petrified, um, like you know, almost dead uh, at the feet of the of the statue. And yeah, so yeah. Schiller says the only thing that right the, for shame, if like the, you only come to truth through guilt, right, or like you only come to truth by having to like having messed everything up and had the universe kind of like come down on you. I guess is a, is a similar idea, you know, like you really have to play out all the tragedy to, to know, you know, certain things are, are, you know, bad. Hmm. Yeah, like to, I think that's the thing, like people often want to skip steps and they want easy answers. And so in terms of what you referred to around the, the susceptibility to psyop operations that are so clearly um immature like the QAnon mythos that was just concocted and created in 2017 very clearly from intelligence operations people's susceptibility to believing that is that they haven't been used to um rigor just basic intellectual discipline because to think of truth in in in, in its in its essence in its ironic simple essence is often um, you have to really work on your mental and emotional muscles to begin to do that. It's like going into surgery. You know, you have to work on capacities to start doing surgery that will help people in the real world. You can't just go from zero to surgery and you're doing, you're essentially doing that sort of thing. You're, you're learning how do you make uh, coherent incisions with your, with your mind scrutiny, you know, passing judgment, weighing evidence making the next step before you get your mind around a concept that you're pursuing. And right. evil is one of the most challenging concepts in its real essence. It's, and I think we've just been a little bit made mushy by popular entertainment, Hollywood, other things that gave us a very naive one dimensional view of evil and good. Yeah. So we're not, we didn't equip ourselves to properly take the time the way Schiller does in his poetry and in things like the ghost seer where he, he even yeah. says, that, I think, what is it in the, in this wonderful essay, the, 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 the apparitionist, the ghosts here, he describes how the, uh, the young German prince who's being targeted for this Venetian operation, he, he profiles, he spends a few page at the, pages at the beginning, and Cynthia did a really good, great uh, lecture on this, profiling yeah. the German prince, just saying like, yeah, he, uh, he's somebody who really he's born into this rich family, he's a few steps removed from becoming the actual uh, crown, you know, or, or king of whatever region of Germany, but he's obviously been targeted uh, while he's on vacation in Venice. And growing up, he's been a bit of a religious fanatic, but he now, he, he loves philosophy and he um, broke from his religious extremism that he had earlier, but he didn't properly think through why it was wrong. He, you know, and, and he sort of carried his chains with him. And anybody who was sensitive to his, the chains he was carrying around could easily grab those chains and start playing with them because he, he didn't right. take the time to get to know himself. And so he became a plaything throughout the course of this whole story where he's just deconstructed, deconstructed, and then repatterned um, into the synthetic personality yeah. as he's being positioned to go back to Germany finally, now that he's a, a new, a new, a new being that's been, you know, processed through yeah. proto Tavistocki and Venetian operations to become an agent for Venice in Germany. And I mean, Schiller just does such a, an incredible job in this, in this study mass. And he, yeah. you know, and it's, yeah, it's not new. Right. Okay. So like, actually, I mean, I think that's, none of this is new. You know, these things have been going on. Like this is very old stuff. These things have been, uh, you know, yeah, this isn't new. So it's like, I mean, we may as well, we should, we should understand it. And rather than treating it with this kind of having all this make believe that stops us, or but like in the case of the Schiller one, right? There's what you what Schiller describes is like these become formulas. They, they they have these as formulas, and so they only work if people their magic only works because people don't realize like, I mean, what it is. But that's obviously right. If they, but you know, the, the guy's confused in the, in the ghost seer, you know, he has faith, he lost his faith. Uh, then he's wooed with all sorts of mysteries, things he can't seem to explain, apparitionist magic and illusions, right? What is the apparitionist? He's basically an illusionist, uh, the guy that they're dealing with, right? The psyops, magicians is really a thing, uh, a term 
within like the Intel PsyOps community because they're the masters of illusions. And the whole point, the reason things become believable is because they seem so real. How could all these things, you know, um, and they go to great lengths is what Schiller says, like the, depending on the value of the target, right? They'll go to crazy lengths. That is the thing that will blow people's minds and that they have trouble wrestling with because why would somebody do that? And that's where it's like, what's motivating this thing to go to such lengths? It seems unbelievable. Uh, and they're scared or they don't want to entertain that. And so, but it's really because they lack a deeper sense of understanding of goodness and wisdom and these things such that the truth and these mysteries are, you know, it's hard to pick one apart from the other. And the oligarchy uses mystery, right? Because it's confusion, right? The whole point, it, there's, you got to have the turbulence where people become, are confused enough and scared enough or unsure, unmoored, unanchored. And that's when they're open to new ideas, right? They'll grab something that seems to kind of make sense of everything. But that, so it's a formula then. You know what I mean? It's not, it's, an, it's a, a clever art, if we will. It can become artful or clever. I don't like to call it artful, but um, yeah, they're formulas. I think that's that's helpful for people to see, like to understand the, what these kind of formulas, how they work. And then without telling them that that formula is the thing that like, that's why they believe the shit they believe. Don't get them to defend their make-believe right away. Just have a conversation about how magic works, how apparitionists and illusionists create their illusions. Then it becomes easier, double loop, start, you know, yeah, double loop, break the bind. Okay. Like that term from trance to transcendence, from trance to transcendence that you, uh, you're playing with. That's a good, it's a good idea. Right. Well, Dave, this is a, a wonderful little journey. Great way to spend the Saturday, Sunday afternoon. Thank you. And uh, oh, it's put a fun, it's fun to hear from everybody. Good. I'm just seeing a few blocks, but I mean, I, 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 I arrowed, I, there's all sorts of folks here. So yeah, it was nice to hear from people. Okay. Dasha just threw out, <laughs> diving Dasha, you're like Indiana Jones as you like just roll right through that, that closing, closing wall right before it crushes you and you get your hat. Uh, well, why Dasha asks, well, do you want to ask your last question, Dasha? Um, okay. Uh, wait, I don't understand what this what them not understanding what good really is has something to do with them not understanding why those people do those things could you explain that well it's that they can how can you face something that's the whole point of going back to like the 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 family the politics of the family the family dynamics that lang studied the children come up with make-believe right they they create false selves and false worlds in order to 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 create a reality that's livable that they can function in since the truth of like the dysfunctional family is not something that a little child is able to deal with right so reflected glory or disgraced shadows either there's something wrong with the family which and if they try and they they're children they don't they, there's no way to deal with that and that the people will spaz out if you do. So the children uh, create make-believe. Often that's what happens, right? So you, we get false narratives. And so same thing if you're dealing with fast forward to adulthood, and it turns out that a lot of this make-believe stuff, well, they learned it early on. It's something that people learn early on. Adults are always involved, always doing make-believe too. And of course, I mean, when you're dealing with really dark things, uh, you can't just drop things on people, right? Like that's the, that's the catch with even the therapeutic stuff. Like people who have been through, uh, you know, difficult things, like they can't just be dropped. Like therapists have protocols and things they have to do. You can't just revisit things that people experience that broke them as children uh, and just bring it all back up. They could kill themselves. Like that's a real thing. 
So there needs to be a way to approach these things. And so in a lesser, in a different degree, but the same kind of idea, you can't just dump everything on people or you, you see what happens when you do, right? They, 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 the young people today call it the cope, right? It's a cope. So they, they come up with copes, things that they tell themselves to, to justify things. They don't believe in conspiracy theories, right? You're paranoid. That's not the way it happened. This is all stuff that was modeled uh, from dysfunctional families, false memories, telling people that they're paranoid. You're a conspiracy theorist. That comes from modeling trauma. So people are, the, you know, what a piece of work man is, as uh, Shakespeare said. So people, yeah, they have a capacity for make-believe, very much so. And if we just try and swat it away and be like, oh, this is irrational, that's not really getting at it, right? Like the purpose is to like, un to get at why. And that's why I was saying like, if they really, it's the lack of the understanding of the good and like the real thing that they lack. And because they lack that, there's this kind of insurmountable reality for them. So we need to help people cultivate the good faculties. I think that's the way to really fight evil or the bad is not just to talk about the problems, right? There's all these experts on problems on all the bad things going on in the world, but how do you develop the good things? How do we develop the good stuff? Wait, so by, by the word good, you meant fundamental truths. Big G. Ah, then, okay, then I understand it. Thanks a lot. And, and small g, the good stuff, but you know, but the big g. Small g being an intimation of the big g. It's like I guess like you were saying, the uh the big the big S and the little s of the the self that's that's part of the changing world that's that's uh contaminated with impurities and then the the big s that ideal self that is free of contradiction that we strive for but will never fully 100 percent achieve but that gives us sort of a, a blueprint to um to move towards that's the sort of same thing with the big g little g too right like the there's little goods but then there's the, the idealized good as well that gives meaning to the little goods and maybe helps to direct the little goods to become bigger and better goods the more you you develop that relationship. The big G is the reason for the little G's, yeah. not the other way around. Mm -hmm. There's a lot to work with there. I, I like this. And I, I like the fact that, again, like all good classes, and you're really, you know, last, last presentation you did, uh, did this too, is that you raise a lot of questions. You always want to raise, in, in some sense, more questions than you've answered, though we have, I think, gotten much further at answering a lot of questions that we were we were further removed from at the beginning of this presentation on many points. Uh, did you did you make a little finger because you wanted to say something else? No, I, no. Okay. Um, so thank, thank you, Dave, and thank you, everyone, for, for taking the time. Yeah, I put thanks. some of Dave's links to uh, both the essay uh, that this class was inspired by, as well as the Chained Muse and New Liar. I think, Dave, you put out the new issue of the, the New Liar magazine, right? Yeah, and just go on my Substack, Age of Muses, and that's where I, you know, if you scroll through posts, you'll see, yeah, uh, everything will sort of, you know, whether it's from one place or another, all, you can find a bunch of my stuff. So Age of Muses, Substack, and yeah take note of that just google that age of muses dave substack david and... Crossland. yeah age of muses david Crossland. thank you everyone thank you dave take care bye thank everybody you. thank you, you. Bye. Soon, everybody. Thank, bye. you. Thank, bye. thank you thanks bye-bye